Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kathy Campbell. Um, I moved here when I was 13 from Hawaii. It was Kathy Cox. My family moved here um, to buy the old marina on Grand Lake, and that was the um, early 70s. Earthy years, or what I call the first earthy years, the brown and green years. Um, Grand Lake back then was um, fun, robust, different than it is now. Smaller, uh, much more of a extreme seasonal community where you had um, all the lake residents come for the summer. Uh, back then, kids, you know, had a full summer. Uh, vacation, so kids came here for summer jobs, you know, right after Memorial Day and left Labor Day, and the dynamic was um, much more of a, I don't know, casual resort community. Um, a lot of playfulness. Um, they used to have in town the as I what uh, things that I miss that they used to have in town when I first moved here. I don't know, a lot of live theater in town, a lot of live plays that were took place on Main Street, independent from the um, the theater, uh, well, we used to call it the Troupe, but now the theater in town, but there used to be shootouts on Main Street, and when Sombrero Stables was in town, Rocky Garber, um, the mayor of the town and his sons, uh, the stables actually sat where, right near the bowling alley, actually a block over. Um, would play like Clint Eastwood and, you know, the law enforcement and our boat boys would play the, you know, the outlaws and uh, during Western week or most weekends in the summer they would uh, have live shootouts and, you know, the guys would run over the roofs of buildings and in and out of restaurants and they would be captured and put in the jail and there used to be a jail actually in the park um, that was by, uh, actually where the library I think sits now, there was an actual county jail. Um, um, and then usually it was also used for fun. Um, what else can I say about those years? Um, the winters up here were long. Um, when we first moved here, well, the reason my family moved here was my father had decided that this would be one of the best resort communities on the planet because they were building Bowen Mountain Ski Area. And not to say it isn't one of the best resort communities on the planet, I love Grand Lake, but he saw the future in the community with the skiing during the winter and the lake during the summer. Um, there's the Two Peaks, Bowen and Baker. They had done all the snow depths for Bowen and they were ready to move with that project. Um, I believe, and I mean, I, you'd have to actually check this out, but the reason that it was closed was the earthy years, the park had a lot of money back in those days and they didn't want the volume of traffic through the forest service near the park. Um, for the ski area, and so they purchased most of the ranches, which were accesses to that that property, and that pretty much shut down Ball Mountain. So the town itself um, is distinctly, I guess, two towns in one. You have your resort community, um, people who have come here to play but make their living and their livelihood elsewhere, and then you have people here who struggle very hard to make a living and that becomes very prevalent during the winter months. Um, so after Ball Mountain was closed, Grand Lake went through a number of years um, trying to find itself. Um, also you had at that time, I think the gas shortage hit about the late 70s. And at that time also bikers used to come in here for Fourth of July, and so it was a little bit rougher. And um, so Grand Lake struggled with trying to figure out a way to make an income or feed the town during the winter time. And there, for many years, it was the snowmobilers versus the cross-country skiers. And all of us love cross-country skiing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with um, having a community where people are just skiing in and out. That would be beautiful. Unfortunately, the cross-country skiing community doesn't feed the town. Um, they don't um, stay in the resorts. They're not the type of uh, groups that come in and spend a lot of money in restaurants and um, buy things in the gift shops and that kind of thing. So this town starved until it finally switched to um, its focus to the snowmobiles. And initially that was um, seen as kind of bad because snowmobiles are messy and they're gas and all that kind of stuff. Of course the new sleds now are much cleaner and neater and, and the town has done a tremendous amount to um, have hundreds of miles of groom trails and now the the winter months here, with it being one of the snowmobile capitals of, I think, the country, I'm sure, 
um, is, is wonderful. You come into town and gift shops are open and restaurants are open and inns are, you know, there's more places to stay and there's a, definitely an energy in, in the town and it's, it's very unique to this town as far as the snowmobiling. Um, what else can I say about Grand Lake? Um, Where did you go to school? Oh, went to school in Granby, in Middle Park High School. Uh, small school. Um, the small schools up here, um, like any school system, I think are very um, have its um, strengths and its weaknesses. I think the strengths for the school system up here is that kids are given a fair amount of responsibility early. Um, the classes are small, so teachers really know you. Um, you're connected to a lot of things in the environment. You're connected to a lot of things in business. Um, kids aren't uh, pampered up here. Uh, they uh, dash home from school to help, you know, with a ski rental or uh, the boat marina, or they grew up with a, a lot of responsibility. They grew up with a, a world that has a lot of um, environmental changes where they can, you know, could be caught in snowstorms, windstorms, firestorms, whatever, and so that when they leave Granby or Middle Park High School to go to the rest of the world, um, they're pretty um, smart kids. They're pretty, they're well to they're in good shape to take on the world. Um, they may lack a little bit maybe because they didn't have Latin or Calculus 4 or whatever, but I have no doubt that they can handle it if, if they want to because they've been given other great tools. When did your father's kind of business open in the spring and close? Um, the marina itself, which was originally um, Mrs. Millinger had it, uh, the few robots on the beach, then Killian's had the two hats. The marina actually opens uh, once the ice goes off the lake. Um, the interesting dynamic about this lake is that most of the boats are stored in the boathouses around this lake. And so the marina has always been tasked with the, the job or the contract to put these boats in. So the marina boys go around and the ice goes off the lake usually around the 10th of May, somewhere on a week on either side of that. And everybody of course wants their boat in right away. And they go around the lake and they put them in the water and, you know, take out the winter fluids and get them ready for summer, or the wooden boats, of course, they go ahead and they're, they're soaked. And, um, and, you know, by, usually, hopefully by Memorial Day weekend, most people have at least one or two boats running. As far as closing up, the marina, everything starts to shut down um, right after Labor Day. Um, even though the weather's still nice, people have moved on to school and other dynamics, uh, other parts of their lives. And then before the freeze, you know, end of September, mid-October, they go ahead and put the boats up. And um, they're stored for the winter, and then it starts again. Um, the marina used to be a year-round business, because we did small bills during the wintertime, we did Arctic Uh But now it's just um, just open for the summer with my brother. What was your role? Did you work in the family business? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> when we first moved here, uh, the marina has since gone through a fire, but when we first moved here, the marina building itself went all the way to the main gate, and there was a paint shop, and above the paint shop there was a boat boys dorm, and we housed 12 teenage, college-age boys for the summer um, in bunk beds, and, um, and they worked at the beach. Uh, the rental part of the operation and um, so I usually worked on the dock when we first moved here on, on you know, um, helping with the boats and pumping gas and, you know, could change spark plugs and help change out a shaft in a criss craft or something like that and, um, and then uh, a few other town jobs during the summer we all seemed to work at Dave and Haven like one of the restaurants or Winding River Ranch which was a great experience and then eventually came back and ran uh, the beach for, for my family. And uh, in the meantime, the marina went through a fire, and so um, we lost the dorm part. So kids who network at the beach have to find housing elsewhere. But it was fun. It was right. Who were some of the characters that you can re you remember from back in the era when uh, your family had the marina? Um, oh, gosh, there were many. Uh, I think we mentioned that we talked a little bit about the Bussy family um, that moved here from Illinois. They own Winding River Guest Ranch, and um, there's and actually Winding River Campground as well. Um, I'd say characters are just very lively people. Uh, Mrs. B, um, we call her Mrs. B, um, with this ball of energy. In fact, I saw her the other day. She's got to be late 80s, I guess now. I mean, she's just this incredible goer and doer. Um, I, it, she inspired me a lot with um, nutrition. Actually, I went to school to be a nutritionist um, from here because of her influence. 
and um, she speaks for Shackley, and she ran the ranch with um, great energy. Um, a lot of very uh, famous people stay up there because of her diets, like the Denver Nuggets would come, and she would do their diets, and uh, share the singer's parents would come every summer, and it was very interesting. Um, her son Bobby uh, runs the ranch now. Um, again, um, great guy. I think he's still roping at his age, and wins the tooling contests every year in Wyoming, and um, and then his his sons um, were who I used to babysit. Um, they were fun people. Um, we ride in Western Week every year. That's back actually when they had Western Week and the and the Buffalo Barbecue. That's when they used to really do a buffalo, and you'd ride into town and you know do that. Um, other characters, um, the Hackerts that own the cleaners for Louie um, actually was eventually clobbered by a moose <laughs> uh, later in life, but there was a dry cleaner in town and uh, he would uh, had a car in town with big speakers on it and go around town all, every year and announce all the events in town. Um, the Garbers, um, who had Sunboro Stables, um, he was mayor of town for, for many years, and uh, his sons always did sort of this Clint Eastwood act, you know, during the summer. Um, God, there were a lot of the Winters, who owned Winters Cabins, uh, people around the lake. Um, I, you know, there were a lot of very fun, creative people. There was a gentleman who used to stand in town, looked like Colonel Sanders. He used to stand right on Main Street at that intersection uh, where the post office used to be and direct traffic uh, where they collect now for the fireworks. Ed Smith. Ed Smith. And um, he was he was delightful. He would just volunteer his time during the summer. I think uh, people like that add a lot of charm to the town, which uh, I think sometimes the, the town, we're missing that sometimes. But I, I like that. Um, there used to be, um, there were um, other things that went on during the winter, right? I can't remember what the characters were per se, but we used to do a lot of um, funny things like blindfolded snowmobile races, progressive snowmobile dinners. There were car races on the lake, you know. It was a lot more, a little more robust, less choreographed, I guess you'd say. Yeah, that's fun. Um, other characters, I'd have to. Uh, Ken Bruton owns Sun Valley Guest Ranch. We used to all go up there and take pack trips with him years ago. Those are great fun, you know. You take go up for a week and the horses in the fall. And how about in the yacht club? Mm -hmm. Did you have, were you members of the yacht club when you were? Oh yeah, here? oh yeah. We joined right after we moved here, um, because I had sailed in Hawaii. Um, right away, um, I was invited to crew, which was great. It was pro promoted, I guess, my um, 30 years plus years of crewing on this lake. Um, I crewed first for Lance Sherwood on his M20. We were a little light, the two of us for an M20. We spent a lot of time in the drink. Um, and I crewed for Martin Harrington, which was probably the, the most fun summer I've ever had. We didn't do very well, but um, I can't remember ever going out and not just coming back with my sides aching from laughter. It was, it was Martin and his brother Tim and uh, a, a, another friend uh, on board. Um, I crewed for Jim Munn um, when Scott Munn, who's now at 6'4", 6'3", one of the best sailors in the lake was just a little guy, and um, Jim was larger than life. He was, um, I think, um, the man is incredibly missed. He was a sportsman, the high altitude glider records, Canadian, U.S., Mexico, U.S. border, I think, records for glider, and so it made him a great sailor. Um, you could spot his mi his smile, you know, halfway across the lake. Um, Patrick Henry was back in those days, the Henrys at the end of the lake. Um, he ran all the races. In fact, we have his old boat, Mai Tai. It was the Henry's boat. We renamed the boat. And uh, I vividly remember Pat going around the lake. Um, back those days, they came and told you when to race. You sat at home, and uh, it was really kind of cushy. And the um, committee would come around and fly a flag. You had course one, two, or I think three. Uh, which basically was East End start of the Yacht Club start. Um, in fact, when the Henry Homes sold, we all worried in the Yacht Club that the new owners didn't understand that we needed the top of the boathouse to start the races. And um, But uh, they'd come around the lake and tell you when to race. Um, back then you had one race a day, and that we thought that was really big. And uh, there was one day during Regatta Week that you had a two-race day, and that was a huge day. Of course, now with the new shells and the shorter courses, we'll have back-to-back -back races, you know, three or four in a day. Um, it's changed a lot, but it was fun. Um, the showboat and dreamboat were on the lake back then. Mm -hmm. Right, the marina, when we bought the beach, which I, I 
do, this is one of the things I miss the most, I think, is the uh, tour operation was just the antique wooden Chris Craft. So there were two boats, showboat and dreamboat, like 26 and 29 feet kind of cabin cruisers, twin engine tour boats. And then there were three runabouts, um, utility Chris Craft, and I think Holiday, Vagabond, and uh, I don't know if it was Lemon was the other one, there were three of them. And they would do like short tours around the lake, like 20 minute tours or two lake tours. Uh, Dreamboat and Showboat always did an hour tour around the lake. And, uh, and the boys, the boat boys back then were very creative because they got tipped big time. So they would do things like, uh, this is my favorite, um, they would get three boat boys on showboat. One would be the driver, one would be some sort of passive nice guy, the other one would be the obnoxious tourist. And the tour around the lake took 45 minutes, well they had to chew up an hour. And uh, so at the end of the tour, to chew up an hour's worth of time so you could sell an hour cruises, there was a speed run from the beach dock, the uh, water dock, to essentially right over here by Gruber's. And you would talk about the boat. Say this is a 19 whatever Chris Craft twin engine, blah, blah, blah. Well, the obnoxious tourist boat boy who had been just a pain in the patoot the whole trip, um, they would time it when they would start the speed run, they put both the engines, you know, in full throttle, the boat would kick up, off it go, the obnoxious tourist, of course, would fall off the back. The boat boy driving would go, oh my god, he's going to drown in this cold water. He would run down the middle of the boat and do a, a, a wonderful dive off the back of the boat as well to save obnoxious tourists. And of course, the boat is going across the lake with no one driving. And so then the passive boat boy tourist, pretending that he didn't know anything about boats, gets up and says, does anybody know how to drive this thing? And of course, he gets it shut down right before it crashes into Gruber's boathouse. And then, and then to add to end this little deal, he would back it all the way from Gruber's all the way around the end of the lake and back it into the slip. And the three boys would get just bunches of money and tips. I mean, it was, it was like a mini show. People loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd have cruises at the end of the night, did a cruise, talc tours would come up uh, for uh, three nights a week. And because they would be coming up over Trail Ridge from Denver, actually they're on a, like a five or six day tour, you know, the, the, what do you call it, itinerary. Um, when they would get here for the dinner cruise, you never knew what the weather was going to be like. And I can remember many um, cruises where the cover was zipped over the whole boat, and these poor people are all in the boats. And we get out in the lake, and you couldn't see anything, and you'd be wiping the plastic up, you know, moisture off the windows, going, "Yeah, well, there's the yacht club, and there's the hall house, and whatnot." And and then you would, you know, supposed to sit on the lake in this rainstorm or whatever, and have dinner. And, and inevitably, you know, the the rolls for the meal would be on one boat, and the meat would be on the other. So you'd have to like unzip windows and pass food across. Uh, but people loved it. They were funny. It was it was um, casual. It was cute. And then once the rain passed, which it always does, um, we'd unzip the covers and take people around the lake again. And they just loved it. It was fun. It was unique. And I'm too commercial, I guess, to say. Well, the city runs things. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of value there. Yeah, I think there's just... It, it's just different, you know. Um, I think certain things people expect more, or I don't know, it's just a little different, but um, actually we're talking about um, a wreck one year with the, with the beach, the beach was always a, a, a hotbed of things happening, um, we had a tour boat, I think it was Vagabond, but I'm not sure, it was a two-lake tour, and the driver, very nice kid, um, Brian, and this couple, an older couple, and they were coming back from Shadow Mountain, and they ended up in a hailstorm. And so he was trying to get them back as quickly as possible. And he was coming into the dock, and of course on those old Chris's, the bow is way up when the boat is in full, full bore. And this is just a single edge of Chris, six inches in the middle. And for some strange reason, a family in a little lap straight um, outboard decides to leave the public dock area and go out in this storm. Why, I don't know. And what they were doing is they were hugging the edge of the roof of the outwater dock, trying to stay out of the storm, but they were still heading out to the lake. And uh, not Brian, Brad. Brad, as Brad was coming in, he couldn't see them and clobbered into the side of the boat, and the whole thing ended up smashed into the slip. The woman on the one side was hurt quite bad. Uh, she was in the hospital for several months. Um, everybody else in the boat was fine. Uh, more stings and bruises and things like that. And the boat was overloaded. I think it was rated like for five, and they had like eight people on it. So three boarders. Had lots of things going on. They would have funerals on the beach. The boys would.
bury somebody and uh, have a big mound and, and or they'd have hanging to the edge of the dock. Um, I remember up there playing frisbee on top of the roof. And <laughs> it was very fun. <laughs> it sounds like you had a good year. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. You know, kids came here. It was a different dynamic and I, I think I missed that. I missed that for like my boys. Um, school systems, you know, you had three months and you had a summer job. I mean, you left school, you went right to your summer job and um, summer jobs were a riot. You know, like working at Dave and Hayden for the summer, of course, the two dining rooms, Sal's old owned it back then. And, you know, you would come on and for breakfast you'd do split shifts, but in the meantime, in between your work day, you would be out water skiing or running around the lake at night filling boats with popcorn, teepeeing, you know, I mean, there was just a lot of, you know, simple summer antics. And um, and then, you know, they get into the late August, you know, months, and everybody was, you know, last midnight water skiing and, you know, and, and things like that before you went back to school. With, you know, as summer romances ended, you know, it was just yeah. fun. <laughs> um, I think now, unfortunately, with the school systems cutting into the June and June, August so much, I think a lot of kids miss some of that, you know, full... Much. And it's hard, actually it's harder in the town. People, you see that all the time, where somebody will be standing there in August 10th or 12th and saying, gosh, why can't they seat me for dinner tonight? Um, they've got empty tables, and then the owner's trying to explain to you, we can put you at that table, we have no one to bring you food, because half their staff walks for, you know, school's endeavors start. My son's already back right now, the 12th of August, and colleges start earlier. And it's just, you know, different stuff. So. You have two boys? Yes. Yes, I have an uh, older son, Thomas Patterson Campbell IV. Um, both boys um, are a fifth generation through this home. Um, he starts college next week in CU. And then I have a younger one, Richard Crawford Campbell V. And um, he'll start, he's already, he's a senior in high school. I mean, junior, I mean, freshman in high school, sorry. 18 and 14 of their ages. Um, this home here, our home, or their legacy, was built in 1887 by... Senator Thomas Patterson, and there's Patterson Peak somewhere over here. You can see it in the porch. And um, and then it's been each actually generation. There's been two boys that have inherited and flipped the property up. So they will be the fifth generation to this state. Nice, nice legacy. You had to be on. I mean, that was fun. I mean, working at the ranch was a riot. Um, I recommend it for any kid. Um, uh, where is the one you ever ran? Uh, up at Columbine. Right. When we when we we bought a home on Winding River, it's on the fourth hole of the golf course, and Columbine had just started. You know, the lake had just been built, and the homes were starting around the lake. It's not the density there is now. And, um, you know, working there for the summer, you had you were really on all day. And so I worked as a cook, and you'd come in and you'd start the Wranglers breakfast like at five. And the boys would come in get breakfast and the staff would go out and they'd be bring, bringing in the horses for the day for, you know, for trail rides and things like that. They also helped Bobby with the working end of the ranch, the hay and all that. Then you shift to guest breakfast and then you, actually, we did all the dishes back then by hand. Um, we had the guest cabins and Mrs. B had already built a big pool building. Then you were off between maybe that for a little couple hours to lunch and a lot of times you went out and hung with the guys in the barn and watched the hay come in and ate ice cream and then you started lunch, and you had a break between lunch and dinner, dinner service. And um, and then after dinner, we had staff entertainment. So we'd play um, broom ball on, oh, it was a riot, Shetland ponies, bought brooms, and, and big, like, plastic balls. We'd play it on the lawn, just like polo, except it would be these little bitty horses, and the guests loved it, especially with the wranglers that were really tall because their feet would drag on the ground. And uh, we'd have, you know, square dances in the barn, and Mrs. B had something every night. And the staff, I, you, I guess you were, I, I guess you were expecting, you, you were expected to be there, right? But you wanted to be there. I mean, it was the thing you did. And then the people go to bed, and you'd still be up late at night. And then at 5 o'clock in the morning, you were up there. <laughs> yeah. Do they still do those things at Wayne or Red? You know, I don't know. Um... I, I don't know exactly. I think it's a little bit more of a working end of the ranch now. I think Bobby, plus they've developed some of it, you know, for residences. I don't know what the guest end is anymore. Um, you know, Travis has the trash company. Uh, that's the, uh, the younger son, Bobby, Robbie, uh, runs the working end with his dad. Um, but I don't know what the guest 
you know, I know Mrs. B's got um, still the horses. She now has um, Arabians out there. Um, oh, now this is a great Elaine Buffy story. This is a great. <laughs> Elaine, I don't, I, she met her. She's like this big and a spitfire. And we went on an experience ride with her. Where during the At the end of the week, we would call out the guests that could ride well. And they would want to go on an experience ride, usually it's bareback. And we'd run them over hill and dale and through the river and all that kind of good stuff. And with Mrs. B, and she usually led it. And she was, she's an exceptional rider. And there would be like three or four guests, maybe more. And then there would be the wrangler, one of the wranglers, like Steve Swalhart or somebody. And then a couple of us would join. So I, a lot of times I went on it. And we're riding back into the Baptist camp area. And Mrs. B always looked perfect. She always had this beautiful western outfit on. And she was kind of like Audrey Hepburn riding. She always had her hair up. And she had this fun thing. She was gorgeous. And she's riding along, and she goes over this log, and she ha has an English riding background, so even though she's riding bareback, a, a western horse, she's kind of post, and she, this little bun thing she had her, pinned to her head catches on a branch, and she goes on, and is hanging there on this branch, <laughs> and Steve Swassard is hysterical, he goes, I've got it, and he goes running up there, and he grabs it, plucks it off the tree, runs to the bend getting up the line, because she's slowed down by now, he hands it to her, she goes, just a minute, she puts her hair, puts it back on, okay, we're off, <laughs> and off she goes, she was just a, a riot, um, it was fun, you know, so, so you kind of hope your children have good experiences like that, but every yeah. generation is different. Yeah, you do. You, um, what I value is fun. I probably was different than what my parents did, and you know, think I'm sure my parents said, "Oh, we sat around and played kick the can, and that was a lot," you know, whatever. And I'm going, oh, "How could you be inside in the computer game when there's so much?" But um, I think in each generation we have some fun. I don't know. It's a great place to be, though. I mean, you can't not have fun here. You really have to work.